In 1917, as the First World War raged in France, the writer Virginia Woolf took her daily walk across the Sussex countryside. Although a long way from the conflict, she could hear guns echoing across the English Channel, and reports from the front line affected her deeply. For the rest of her life, she would look for ways of writing about this violence and breakage. Virginia Woolf came of age as a writer at a strange time, when Europe was so shaken it barely knew itself. In these uncertain years, the Victorian novel, with its firm plots and knowable characters, seemed out of place. Woolf sensed the need for change. Everything was going to be new. Everything was going to be different. Everything was on trial. Dividing her writing life between this quiet stretch of Sussex and a home in London, Virginia Woolf would play a leading role in a literary revolution. Mrs. Dalloway, published in 1925, would help change our thinking about what a novel could be and how it could be written. In writing this book, Woolf would tackle subjects close to her heart. Reading her manuscripts and diaries, I'm going to follow her through the ups and downs of the creative process and catch a glimpse of a great writer at work as she brings a radical new novel to life. Big Ben strikes. First a warning, musical. Then the hour, irrevocable. The leaden circles dissolved in the air. In people's eyes, in the swing, tramp and trudge. In the bellow and the uproar, the carriages, motor cars, sandwich men shuffling and swinging. This was what she loved. Life, London, this moment of June. When Virginia Woolf started to write Mrs. Dalloway in 1922, she was already a respected writer and reviewer. But she sensed that this was going to be her high summer. This was her moment. If she was going to make a mark on the literary world, it had to be now. The story unfolds over the course of a single day in London. It dips in and out of many different lives but focuses on two people in particular. Part of Wolf's audacity is that these people never meet. There's Clarissa Dalloway, a society hostess, the wife of a conservative MP, and she's going to be throwing a lavish party in the evening. And then there's Septimus Warren Smith, a shell-shocked soldier whose honorable military career is about to come to a tragic end. The regular chimes of Big Ben punctuate the novel, ringing out across the city, linking disparate people as they pause to register the time. Now, it must be said that the plot of this novel doesn't sound very promising. A man walks around London, a woman prepares for a party and receives a visit from someone she didn't marry. Time passes. But what makes Mrs. Dalloway so inventive isn't the plot itself, but the way that it's written, and the way that all the different strands of it relate. Parallel stories, parallel lives, linked only by a web of associations. Mrs. Dalloway would be a risk, but it echoed the mood of the times. Britain had emerged from the First World War a damaged nation. The term shell shock first appeared in newspaper reports in 1922, 
the year Virginia Woolf began Mrs. Dalloway. It resonated with what she already knew, that the past is always with us, that memory persists, that something fundamental had changed, something that could not be healed by victory parades and bunting. So at this very tense time in the early 1920s, it feels like all society is facing, in a way, two directions, thinking back over the war, looking ahead. This is a time when several writers, uh, of whom Wolf's one, are very self-consciously experimenting with new kinds of writing which are supposed to be sort of adequate to a new modern world and, and doing the same quite a sort of rivalrous way. How much was she in conscious competition then with other writers, do you think? She herself, if you read her letters, was quite sort of um, um, unsettled by the experiments of the other sort of great modernist writers of the period. So T.S. Eliot is coming round, <laughs> reading The Wasteland aloud. I mean, that must have felt quite a challenge. Yeah, you might think it was a privilege, but I think it's a bit scary too. <laughs> so what did she do differently then? Well, I think what she tried to do in fiction was to find a form for the novel which was true really to the way people thought rather than what they did or what they said. It's an extraordinary sort of map of internal plots and people's dialogues with themselves rather than what's going on in the exterior, exterior world. She felt very young, at the same time unspeakably aged. She sliced like a knife through everything, at the same time was outside looking on she had a perpetual sense of being out, far out to sea and alone. There's a powerful sense of feelings throttled and of lives disappointed. It's partly about the way the English stiff upper lip totally. has affected our internal emotional Totally, lives. and the stiff upper lipness of it, I think, is really conscious. There's an extraordinary bit near the beginning of the novel where Clarissa Dalloway is thinking about the war when she remembers Lady Bexborough, who opened a bazaar with a telegram in her hand, they said. And they said, brilliantly lets you see that Lady Brexborough is almost admired for the fact that the telegram, which tells her her son has died, has been killed in the war, doesn't stop her doing her duty of opening Carrying the bazaar. On. Yes. yes. And that seemed such a sort of unflinching image of kind of how feeling is controlled and conquered in the novel. Shredding and slicing, dividing and subdividing. The clocks of Harley Street nibbled at the June day, counselled submission, upheld authority, and pointed out in a chorus the supreme advantages of having a sense of proportion. By setting her novel on a single day, punctuated by the chimes of Big Ben on the hour, Wolfe was giving herself a definite framework, a solid shape and structure within which she could deal with some very difficult things, not only the trauma of war, but also some of her own hardest and least containable experiences. While Clarissa Dalloway rejoices in London life, Septimus sees the city very differently. A busy street becomes a nightmarish vision of the trenches. There are men trapped in mines, women burnt alive, and brutality blaring out on placards. In writing Septimus, Virginia Woolf was drawing on personal experience. Woolf had a breakdown, aged 13, following the death of her mother and episodes of mental illness would recur for the rest of her life. At times she was bedridden, plagued by voices and hallucinations. Virginia Woolf saw many doctors in the course of her life, so she was well aware of how the medical profession struggled to understand and treat mental illness. 
in the passages where Septimus is being examined by experts, you can really feel her own frustration coming through. When he felt like that, he went to the music hall, said Dr Holmes. He took a day off with his wife and played golf. Why not try two tablets of bromide dissolved in a glass of water at bedtime? No, there was no excuse. Nothing whatever the matter. Wolf wrote into the character of Septimus some of her own disturbing episodes, merging her private illness with a public story and taking control of her experience by writing about it. Virginia Woolf was torn between the infectious vivacity of London and her desire for solitude and space. At Monk's house in Rodmell, East Sussex, she found an antidote to the city. When she was at Monk's house, work happened here, in a shed at the bottom of the garden. For her, writing was an addiction. She took to it, she once said, as some people do to gin. Wolf took great joy in a well-organised day. From 10 until 1 was her inviolable time for writing. She'd tune up first with a cigarette and then think through the first words. In the afternoon, she'd often go for a walk, sometimes miles and miles, saying over to herself the sentences she'd been writing that morning, letting the rhythm of them fall in tune with her step. And then, in the evening, there'd be immersive reading, perhaps literature or history, and some image or tempo from Shakespeare might start the tune for the next morning's writing. As a publisher and reviewer, Wolf was well aware of new work by other contemporary writers. Setting Mrs Dalloway over the course of a single day in a city was a riposte to James Joyce, whose epic novel Ulysses charts a day in the life of two men in Dublin. Wolf read and wrote about Joyce's novel in 1922, just when the first ideas were forming for Mrs Dalloway. And she was certainly intrigued by it. She acknowledged Joyce's brilliance. She couldn't help feeling it was rather pretentious. She wrote frankly in her diary that she was about as irritated by it as by a queasy undergraduate scratching his pimples. But she knew that, like Joyce, she was attempting something new. And with all innovations, there are risks. In a diary entry for June 1923, Virginia Woolf reflected on the progress of her novel. I foresee this is going to be the devil of a struggle. The design is so queer and so masterful. It is certainly original and interests me hugely. Woolf wrote the first drafts of Mrs Dalloway in three large notebooks now held here at the British Library. To turn the pages is about as close as we can get to witnessing a great novel taking shape. One of the striking things actually is the book itself. I do my writing on, you know, pre-produced A4 pads, but Virginia Woolf loved the feel of, of books, so she always hand-bound her notebooks. There's a wonderful sense of the, the book as an, as an object, and of course, Virginia Woolf was a bookmaker, running a press with her husband, Leonard. She knew about the feel of, of books, and she wanted to write her own in good notebooks. The first page, The Hours. And the hours stayed in her mind as the title of this book. She kept swapping between the hours and Mrs Dalloway, as if she's wondering whether the central thing here is to do with the passing of time across a whole city, a whole nation, 
or whether it's actually this one woman and how everything else is going to impinge on her personal, private, emotional life. This is recognisably Mrs Dalloway, but not quite as we know it. She starts rather solemnly with a procession of young boys, the sons of dead officers, coming away from laying wreaths at the cenotaph. The mood is very sombre. Silence falls on London and falls on the mind. Time flaps at the mast. And of course we know that later Wolfe decided to, ha to begin instead with Clarissa going out into the June morning to hold back that feeling of war for later, to come at it, I think, more obliquely and all the more powerfully for that. It's so exciting to see Wolfe's pen just dashing across the page. You can see the places where she clearly knows exactly what she wants to stay. And then there are pauses and crossings out, hesitations. In a sense, actually, this manuscript is like another sort of diary, because she's marking the date in the margin, so we can see almost day by day what she's thinking and what she's writing. Do you know, we've even got a quick pencil sketch of a floor plan for one of the houses that Virginia Woolf is thinking of renting in London. The wonderful sense of the rest of her life going on at the same time as trying to write this book. I think we can see particularly, actually, that um, the passages with Septimus are really heavily worked, particularly those places where Septimus is having his hallucinations, where he's going to Harley Street and seeing the doctors. You can see the hesitations, lots and lots of different versions. Sometimes during the periods of her illness, she wasn't able to write. I think we get a feeling for two battles going on at once here. Wolf's working at her limits as a writer, cajoling all of this disparate material into a new form. And at the same time, quite inseparably, she's finding a way of writing about the illness she'd never written about in this way before. In Mrs Dalloway, Virginia Woolf wanted to write about what she knew, but to bring the whole world into it. She wanted, she said, to make people talk about everything in the whole of life, so that one's hair stands on end in a drawing room. It was quite a challenge. The central character didn't come easily. Wolf faltered, she almost abandoned the book in a dismal moment when Clarissa seemed too stiff, too glittering and tinselly. Then she had a breakthrough. She invented Clarissa's memories. She showed how rapidly, involuntarily, all kinds of scenes from the past come into mind. And through those memories, we learn about Clarissa's old flame, Peter Walsh, who's just come back from India and is coming to her party. We learn about the mesmerizing Sally Seaton, who Clarissa loved and kissed. We get a sense of some of her frustration that marriage has made her Mrs. Richard Dalloway not even Clarissa anymore. We share, I think, some of her yearning for all the lives she might have led, her wistful reflections on the paths not taken. Wolfe's diaries reveal that the character of Clarissa Dalloway may have been shaped by the unexpected death of a family friend. The circumstances were ambiguous, Reports said she had fallen over the banisters. I wonder how important you think it was that uh, the family friend of her youth, Kitty Maxey, yes. died just yes. when she was starting to yes. write Mrs Dalloway. She was the young woman Virginia Woolf should have been brought up to be. 
she was the young woman her mother had approved of, who'd made the right kind of marriage, and had been a sort of model of rectitude and good manners. But that marriage didn't turn out terribly well. And I don't think she would have been terribly surprised if Kitty had somehow fallen by accident on purpose to her death. And so that there is a sense of being very close up to death. That's very important, I think, for the novel. So Clarissa is a curious blend of Kitty Maxey, whom Virginia Woolf didn't love, and something of herself. Virginia Woolf had her own domestic choices to make. Yes, and she writes one letter when she's 29 to her sister Vanessa Bell. It's a very depressed letter saying to be 29 and unmarried. She was, of course, very beautiful. Very beautiful. Could have seduced anybody she wanted. She could have, and then Leonard Woolf came on the scene, and I think she was not in love with him initially, but she took him very seriously. This was a man she could marry. He was not what her family would have expected because he was Jewish and he had no money. So that's what she writes defiantly when she agrees to marry him. She writes, I'm going to marry a penniless Jew. And yet they were together as writers. And, and I, they were I remember yeah. Wolf saying that this marriage would work because he has written a novel and so have I. Uh -huh. And this is how they saw it. Virginia Woolf completed her redrafts for Mrs. Dalloway amidst the bustle and busyness of Bloomsbury. She revelled in being back at the centre of things, with music, talk and city views once again within her reach. When Woolf finished the novel in good health in October 1924, she could congratulate herself. In a sense, it was a triumph over the illness she'd been writing about and she'd even met the deadline she'd punctiliously set herself six months before. Big Ben strikes and dusk descends across the city. There's a sense of magic and carnival in the air. And at last we arrive at Mrs Dalloway's party. Here, the lives of the society hostess and the shell shop soldier will finally coincide. Party is a summing up of Clarissa's life. People she has known across many, many years come together in it. It's a glittering social occasion, filled with everyone who's anyone in the British establishment, even the Prime Minister. Clarissa is in her element, a magnetic presence at the centre of things, drawing all her guests together. But the gaiety is interrupted by the news that a young man has killed himself. The shell shock Septimus has leapt from his bedroom window and fallen to his death on the railings below. Suddenly, in the midst of the party, among the life and the laughter, there is death. Shocking, palpable, inescapable. Up had flashed the ground. Through him, blundering, bruising, went the rusty spikes. There he lay, with a thud, thud, thud in his brain, and then a suffocation of blackness. Clarissa steps aside from her party. She senses something disturbingly familiar in this stranger's death. Wolf originally intended that Clarissa would kill herself or that perhaps she would die at the end of her party. But then she decided to swap things round. In fact, Septimus would be the one to die and Clarissa would live. This becomes then a novel about Clarissa's survival. Wolf calls the book Mrs Dalloway, naming it after the woman who lives. She makes it, in a sense, a book about a resurrection. By bringing Clarissa and Septimus together in the final scene, Wolf delivers a powerful social critique. 
The party is full of members of the establishment. It's what young men like Septimus fought and died for. His death is a disaster that belongs to all of us. It's society's collective disgrace. Virginia Woolf makes Clarissa walk back into the crowded party. After all the complexity of the novel, the last line is as simple as they come. It is Clarissa, for there she was. Mrs Dalloway was published by the Hogarth Press in May 1925. Virginia Woolf could finally hold a copy in her hands. She had done it. Allowing herself a moment of excitement, she wrote in her diary, I wonder if this time I have achieved something. I might have become one of the interesting, I will not say great, but interesting novelists. Mrs. Dalloway sold well, outstripping all Wolf's previous publications and establishing her as a major modern writer. It paid for the installation of hot water at Rodmel, and even for a loo which was forever afterwards known as Mrs. Dalloway's closet. But it did much more than that. As generations read and reread the novel, they came to appreciate the design more clearly. They saw the achievement of having written Septimus not only as Clarissa's opposite, but also in some ways as her double. They saw the audacity of suggesting that Clarissa, the respectable socialite, also felt very like the young man who had killed himself. With hindsight, there's an inescapable resonance between the final scene of Mrs. Dalloway and Wolfe's own life. In 1941, Virginia Woolf, aged 59 and one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, would walk out across the Sussex Meadows. She did not wish to come back. Her body would be found in the River Ouse three weeks later. Virginia Woolf's death has become perhaps the most famous part of her life, but it's certainly not her greatest legacy. She found narrative form for all those acrobatic flights of thought and association that go on in our minds all the time. She even taught us to read in new ways, negotiating gaps and uncertainties. Looking at the manuscripts, going back through the diaries, I've got a clearer sense than ever before of just how bold Woolf was in her writing. And I really think that these amazing documents give us a powerful sense of just what it took to write what had never been written before. I think it would give her great pleasure to know that almost a century on, we are still captivated by her vision of life, London, this moment of June.